So welcome to the next to last episode of our series on emptiness, where we're going to talk about neither perception nor non-perception. Further, Ananda, the monk, not attending to the perception of the dimension of the infinity of consciousness, not attending to the perception of the dimension of nothingness, attends to the singleness based on the dimension of neither perception nor non-perception. His mind takes pleasure, finds satisfaction, settles and indulges in the dimension of neither perception nor non-perception. What does this mean? Well, you should try it and find out. See, nothingness is different from space. I think I have to point this out because we got a couple of comments from people who are a little mixed up about this, that space still offers a context for becoming. Because space is actually space-time, as we know from Einstein. And space-time allows for movement, change, and therefore becoming, being, and so on, which leads to suffering. But nothingness has no dimensions. It has no measurement. Therefore, it has no time. Therefore, no change and therefore no becoming. So there is no becoming, no being in nothingness. So then the question arises, well, how do I know whether I'm conscious or not? (laughs) If I'm concentrating on nothingness, if I have removed all other perceptions, and I'm just concentrating on the singleness of nothingness, how do I know that I'm perceiving anything? And of course, the answer is you don't. (laughs) It's neither non-perception nor perception, because there's nothing to perceive. This nothingness This is really the emptiness that we've been talking about. The emptiness where there is no opportunity for anything to exist. You see, existence has a beginning, a middle, and an end. Therefore, it's suffering. All perceptions are suffering because they have a beginning, a middle, and an end. So, If we want to be completely free from suffering, we have to go into nothingness so that there's nothing to perceive. But then how do we know whether we're perceptive or not? How do we know if we're conscious or not? Well, we don't. And the thing is that this gives us or simulates the conditions involved in complete merging with Brahman. In Brahman, there is no consciousness because there is no second entity to be conscious of. There's awareness, but that awareness has no object. So the only possibility is to be aware of one's awareness. but you still don't know whether you're being perceptive or not because there's nothing outside of your own awareness to to perceive. And I should mention that because awareness in Brahman is a permanent feature, unchanging, boundaryless, and infinite, that there is never an end to the perception 
or the awareness of awareness. So this awareness of awareness is extremely pleasurable. I can't tell you, I can't express in words how wonderful it is, how beautiful it is. And this is the state just before enlightenment, just before Buddhahood. Let's continue. He discerns that whatever disturbances that would exist based on the perception of the dimension of the infinity of consciousness are not present. Whatever disturbances that would exist based on the perception of the dimension of nothingness are not present. There is only this modicum of disturbance, the singleness based on the dimension of neither perception nor non-perception. He discerns that this mode of perception is empty of the perception of the dimension of the infinity of consciousness. This mode of perception is empty of the perception of the dimension of nothingness. There is only this non-emptiness, the singleness based on the dimension of neither perception nor non-perception. Thus he regards it as empty of whatever is not there. Whatever remains, he discerns as present. There is this. And so this, his entry into emptiness, accords with actuality, is undistorted in meaning, and pure. It's pure because there's no disturbance. There's no disturbance because there's no perception. But you can't say that it's non-perception either because there's awareness of awareness. So this is the most wonderful state. Huh? This is the state just before enlightenment. So when we reach this stage of meditation, which by the way is very, very rare, it's beyond most people's ability to attain because of the deep concentration required. And few people today can put themselves in a, a situation or train themselves to have such deep consciousness, such deep concentration, that they can actually put things completely out of their mind. The mind remains unsteady, the mind remains untamed. Huh? So these states, even in the case of an experienced meditator, can be sometimes only momentary. But just because they're momentary, just because they are fleeting, doesn't mean they aren't real. Now this is something that's brought out by Buddha Ghosh, who's not one of my favorite people, but he does bring out in his commentary that the states of meditation which occur only momentarily are still valid and one can claim attainment on the basis of these. So in other words, the, the aim to remain settled in one of these high states is probably unattainable for most people today. But the attainment of these states uh, momentarily is certainly within the grasp of anyone, any sentient being. Huh? That includes you. <laughs> so we are not presenting these descriptions from the authentic suttas as a curiosity or just for the sake of knowledge, huh? just so that you can brag about knowing about them. Oh, yes, and then there's the state of neither awareness nor... <laughs> Makes uh, for boring cocktail party conversation anyway. You're not going to impress any chicks <laughs> by talking about this stuff. But what you can do is that you can sit down and realize it for yourself. That's why we're doing this. Huh? 
is to open a window to give you an opportunity to uh, give you the possibility to see something, to experience something that you would not have the possibility of experiencing ordinarily. So this is our aim. We want you to take this information and actively um, realize it, implement it, experience it for yourself. See, all of Buddha's teachings are called phenomenological. Phenomenological means experiential, a first person direct experience. It doesn't do you any good to hear that somebody else has realized these things. Well, maybe it would give you a little more confidence in approaching it. Because if anybody, you know, just an ordinary person like myself, can experience these things even momentarily, that means it's possible for anybody. You know, who am I? I'm just an old hippie musician that got interested in meditation. Oh, and incidentally, I have four moksha karakas in my birth chart. <laughs> but that doesn't really matter. You can still approach these states. You can still climb the ladder of meditation one rung at a time. It might be very slow for you. It was pretty easy for me. Well, pretty easy. If you, if you think of years of struggle as being easy, yeah, it was pretty easy. But the main problem has been finding a supportive environment. It's very difficult to find a place where you will not be disturbed. And the disturbances are the obstacles. That's why the meditator in this sutta, the, the monk, uh, actually Buddha himself, he's talking about his own experience indirectly. He gradually sets aside each state to attain the next more subtle state, the next uh, least disturbing state. Each one is an exit, each one is an escape from the previous one. And they go higher and higher towards greater and greater tranquility, less and less disturbance, less and less suffering. So this should be your aim. And this isn't the only sutta that climbs a ladder like this. There are many of them. I'm not going to go into all of them because I think the next series is going to shift back to the Vedic context. I think a lot of people are having difficulty following this uh, because the way of Buddha's thinking is kind of alien to the way we've been trained up. I had to look into the Buddha's thinking because when I attained stream entry in 1984, I had been following a Buddhist style of meditation, but I had very little background in the Buddhist teaching. So when I attained, I was like, oh, what? what just happened? <laughs> I didn't understand it. I know what I had experienced and I knew that it was real, but I didn't understand how it worked, why it worked and even really what it was. So I had to go into a long detour of studying the Buddha's teaching before I understood my own experience, which was kind of weird. <laughs> but that's, that's the way I am. I want to know what's happening under the hood. I want to know how things work and why they work and why they're effective and when they're not effective, why they're not. And that is the kind of thinking, I would call it engineering mentality, <laughs> troubleshooting mentality. That will help you attain the highest enlightenment. Aung Tat Sat, Buddha Saranai. <laughs>